Right. Do you ever wonder why some people see what is and ask themselves what if and turn all of that into what can be? Well, I do, and I have for most of my life. In fact, ever since I lived in New York many years ago, and heard about a group called the Guardian Angels. Not sure anybody knows about them here, but they are a volunteer organization of global citizens, of citizens, unarmed, who are crime patrollers. And they started because a McDonald's cashier, who is the head of this organization, saw a young girl getting mugged outside his store and decided he had enough of the crime in New York City and that he had to do something about it. So he and 12 other friends started the Guardian Angels to patrol the New York City subway system and make it safer for many people. By the time I heard about the Guardian Angels, I had graduated university as a behavioral scientist. I am fascinated by behavior, especially group behavior. And I spent a lot of my time observing people and looking at patterns of behavior and trying to predict why certain people did things that they do and didn't do things that other people do. And that type of information allowed me to do a couple of things in my life. When I worked at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, you use those information pieces to look for behavioral modifiers that can decrease the rate of sexual transmission of HIV, which is what I worked on when I was there. Well, when I worked with the World Bank, I was trying to figure out how to get the right incentives and behavioral supports for poor parents who lived in rural parts of developing countries so that we could convince them to send their girl children to primary school. But not only to primary school, but how do you pick out the right incentives to have their girl children go to secondary school and graduate from there as well? So these things all fascinated me. But let me give you an example of a more current example that's relevant to the talk today. A few years ago, I met a man named Isaac Dorje. Isaac self-identified as a social entrepreneur, just like a business entrepreneur. But his motivation was socially and not financially driven. And his mission was not about making a profit, but about making people's lives better. His story intrigued me. And let me tell you a small bit about it. Isaac was a security guard, high-end security guard, for politicians and wealthy people in Lagos, Nigeria. He was six foot seven, and yes, I can talk in linear, um, <laughs> because I'm an American. Uh, and he was 240 pounds. Um, <laughs> And so when he had to relieve himself after waiting outside a car or a meeting for, for hours, he'd have to go into the bush, which wasn't a very good hiding place for a six foot seven man of 240 pounds. And he got very frustrated by this because there is a lack of, of a toileting culture in countries, very many developing countries, that don't have a lot of running water. So he decided to bring the industry of portable toilets to Nigeria. They only had about 15 portable toilets in the entire country. So he decided to hire homeless men and at-risk youth to build the toilets, and he leased them to single head of household women, of which his mother was one of them. He does a franchise deal where the women get 60% of the pay-for-use toilet, and he takes 40%. And eventually, they save enough money that they can buy the portable toilet and sustain it for their livelihood. This is a great example of a social enterprise. 
But I was fascinated and I was intrigued. And I became hooked when I found out that there was an entire universe of people who called themselves social entrepreneurs. And they were, oh, and, I, and I'm sorry, go. And they were, um, and they were very much um, living and breathing manifestation of a saying I heard recently, which was, some people watch it happen. Others say, did anything happen? Others say, did something happen? And others just make it happen. And Isaac was one of those people for me. At the same time, I was working as a senior vice president at a global corporate communications firm. And I was running the youth anti-drug media campaign for the White House, which was my client. For those of you who are not on drugs in the audience, maybe I did a good job. <laughs> but the, <laughs> we, we won't go any further. <laughs> but the essence of that statement is to let you know that I had a very satisfying job. But when I serendipitously heard about Ashoka, which as Tyler said, is the largest association of social entrepreneurs in the world, I knew my fate was cast. I quit my job, my very comfortable job, uh, and I applied for a job at Ashoka. In the past 10 years, I've had the privilege of researching, speaking with, getting to know, and hear the story of hundreds of entrepreneurs and they are totally inspiring. And I have tried to demystify the secret sauce that makes them different from the framework of everyday society. For example, take Thorkelson. He was a software manager in Denmark, and his child, was diagnosed with autism when he was three years old. And he said, what's going to happen to my child when my wife and I are too old to take care of him? Nobody hires people with autism. What are we going to do? So he started to read everything he could about autism. And he realized that there are some very interesting qualities that people with autism have. They're very focused, they're very persistent, and given a quiet atmosphere, they can accomplish an amazing array of tasks. So he said, wait a second, they would make the best software checkers in the world because you need focus when you're looking at new software to check for the bugs that make it work or don't work. So he, and he's standing in the, in the middle there, so he started to train people with autism on Lego sets and electronic models to show them how things fit together, how to be persistent, how to be rewarded with something that looks great and works at the end. And he decided to start an employment agency for people with autism to do software checking. His biggest client is IBM. And they said, in fact, that many of the autistic consultants they hire are the best employees they have. They come on time, they don't chatter, they don't gather around with the coffee mug, and they sit there and they're persistent and they don't get up until they find the bugs that they're supposed to be finding. Another case in point, Another example is Thorkel Sohn, who is a radio journalist in Germany. And he decided to start a program called Dialogue in the Dark. And Dialogue in the Dark shifts the paradigm between blind and sighted. So everyone goes through an hour's experience in pitch darkness an interactive experience, and they're guided through it by their blind guides. And at the end of the hour, 
people come out and realize that, in fact, the sighted people were the handicapped ones, and the blind people are the differently abled ones. So Thorkel calls people with autism people with positive distractions, and Andreas, people who are blind or physically challenged, as differently abled. So when you shift the frame and relabel things from a negative to a positive, perception around people and what they can do changes dramatically. Doors swing open that have been shut for centuries, and they open into a world of possibilities that would never have existed before without the social entrepreneur being present. Social ent entrepreneurs restructure industry norms. They change market dynamics. They use market forces to create social value. They advance full citizenship, like Thorkel and Andreas, and they cultivate empathy in everything they do. In the middle of my research, it came to me that social entrepreneurs are a special breed of instigators. They are instigators of capacity because they liberate untapped potential and help people find their way into new possibilities. So they go from instigators, and they remind me of my favorite Marcel Proust quote, which is hanging on the wall of my office. And it says, the joy of discovery is not in seeing new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And certainly, social entrepreneurs do that. They also adhere to my favorite definition of an entrepreneur. And that is that uh, developed in the 1900s by a German economic economist named Joseph Schumpeter. And he defined an entrepreneur as the, create, as the source of creative disrupt, disruption necessary for economic growth. And indeed, that captures both a business entrepreneur, an innovative entrepreneur, and a social entrepreneur. So the lesson here is that entrepreneurs see reality the way they are, but they envision a new future. And one of the most amazing things about them is they come from all walks of life. I portray 18 different social entrepreneurs in the book. I've got a French truck driver, an Indian veterinary surgeon. I've got a Nepalese widow. There is a Palestinian PhD biomedical engineer. And there is a German woman who self-defines herself, or self did self-define herself, as a housewife, among others. And I'm sure if I revise the book in the near future, I'm going to have a couple of American University students in it as well. <laughs> but the big commonality I found was something I call the stickiness of past experience. And what I realized that for each social entrepreneur I interviewed, there was something in their past that collided with their present and set their future in motion. So that something that they experienced as a youth, something they witnessed as a young adult, or somebody they saw that was suffering, now they came face to face with it in their present. And they couldn't ignore it. 
because of the breadth and depth of their life experience now, they could no longer ignore doing something about it. Indeed, the problem that they chose to solve seemed to seek them out and stick to them by virtue of their past experiences. All social entrepreneurs start out as critics. They defy conventionality and they do unconventional thinking. They're unconventional thinkers. Their strength of purpose allows inspiration to replace fear of risk with action. Their passion nourishes and kindles a type of follow one's heart courage. The patterns they create become role models for others to follow. And their sensitivity to community inclusion allows people who believe in their innovation to become change makers themselves. Indeed, a social entrepreneur and the change makers they create set up self-perpetuating waves of motion that convey transformation vertically, horizontally, across geographic borders, and beyond cultural boundaries. When the stickiness of past experience is combined with these qualities, a social entrepreneur is born. So what does all of this have to do with our global future? Well, if our ability for social disruption rests on the ability of social entrepreneurs to attract and recruit masses of change makers, then it will take and require a shift in mindset. And it will require us to build a new social architecture that reflects an everyone a change maker world. And if the ability to predict the future is the best way to predict the future is for us to create it, then everyone in this room has to think of themselves as change makers and start creating the world we want to see rather quickly. At the end of my interview with my truck driver, my French truck driver turned social entrepreneur, Francois Marty said something to me that I always want to remember. He said, when you invest in human value, there are never any taxes. And you come out richer no matter what happens. And when you speak from your soul, you speak in a universal language that everyone can understand. That's the core message. That's what inspires me every day. And that's the force of nature that will take what is and turn it into what can be and show us that indeed dreams can defy reality. Thank you.